Good morning, everyone. If we can settle down and it's nice to see all of you coming to our meetings, especially this particular meeting. Remember now that you were there. You were there. So this time we are going to spend together here is just reminding ourselves of things that have happened in the past that include us. And looking forward to the future, what God intends to do with us and through us. Uh, Dr. Davidson is going to speak to us on gain on the book of Exodus. I want to make a confession. I came from Africa. When you come to Andrews, you tend to um, look for certain professors that you have heard in Africa and who have challenged those that have passed before you. And so I heard of certain names. I didn't hear about Dr. Davidson. And so be, being a, a, a self sponsored student, I was trying to get to the cream of the professors. And then uh, one quarter... I couldn't get into certain classes. So I said, well, Exodus, that's, that's good enough. And so I signed up and went into Dr. Davidson's class. And I will tell you, he is a professor per excellence. Because if you listened to him, he doesn't come at you with a sledgehammer as a scholar. He comes to you as someone one with you, right. trying to make the Bible alive and meaningful on your level. Yeah. He doesn't throw at you Greek and Hebrew. He, he will tell you this Hebrew thought or this Greek thought, and make it relevant at your level. It is in his class I first heard the word chiastic structure. And that, that was a big thing. And uh, he explained, uh, I think he did uh, Hebrews, uh, he did um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, how the plural and the singular and... It was so fascinating, so I got hooked. Um, uh, uh, my second confession is that I'm not a very good student. <laughs> I would come in late for class. I would turn my assignment late and things like that, but I passed through his class, so, <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, and so I will pray that again, God's spirit will rest upon Dr. Davidson as he speaks to us, and that we all may be blessed in this experience. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come into this auditorium empty with an expectation to be filled we ask now that you may rest upon your man servant in ways that his words may be sounded like a trumpet with a certain sound. We pray that you will give him the ability to articulate your thoughts, to make them so plain and so clear 
that without a doubt, those of us who will hear him will know your will, and that we may be given the ability to follow through so that our lives may be changed and change those that we interact with and may your whole church here in Minnesota begin to experience a change as we look forward to entering that promised land. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Doc. Thank you for that kind introduction. If I recall, you did well in my class, so I didn't have, you didn't have to worry about uh, getting a bad grade. And I do enjoy sharing about the Exodus, and I'm thankful we have another day to look at it. <coughs> Anybody here for the first time that was not here yesterday? Okay, for your sake, <coughs> after I get the frog out of my throat, we uh, have this Bible trivia question we asked yesterday. And I noticed in my haste I spelled Bible, so the Bible or trivia question. Are there any human beings alive today who per personally witnessed with their own eyes Israel's exodus from Egypt? And we suggested who first? Moses, and then Jesus, and maybe Enoch from heaven. And then who else did we find? Us. Exodus 16, Exodus 13, 8, and Exodus uh, 12, and Deuteronomy 5, Deuteronomy 6, Joshua 24, all those texts give this principle that God wants us to consider, every succeeding, consider, every succeeding generation to consider that we were Pharaoh's slaves, and God brought us out of Egypt. It's our story. It's our history. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we may forget what God has done in our history in Exodus as well as in the Advent movement. So just to review again, we pinpointed the time of the Exodus was this 18th dynasty of Egypt, the, the high, high point of Egyptian history. And we saw how the Hyksos were thrown out, the shepherd kings were thrown out, and the 18th dynasty started with Amos, and then Amenhotep I, and then he didn't have any sons, and so through a concubine, uh, uh, I mean, Hatshepsut was born, a daughter, but he didn't have any sons, so he has the I put on the throne, who's not royal blood. the I doesn't have any sons, so he has to take a concubine that's not of royal blood, and so you see Thutmose II. Thutmose II didn't have any sons with his wife of royal blood, and so he had to take a concubine, and he had sons through that, so Thutmose I, Thutmose II, Thutmose III, all those kings were not having sons to be able to put on the throne. Perfect situation for Moses to be desired to be adopted, especially with the sign, him being found in the river. So yesterday we got to this man, the III, and let's learn some more about him. This is, I am convinced this is the Pharaoh that Moses went to and said, thus says the Lord, let my people go. This is the Pharaoh that Moses could have been. This is arguably the greatest pharaoh of all time who ever lived. Moses could have had that fame, but he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God and gained the reward of heaven. I think he made the right choice. So we, we, let's just review this a little bit, that uh, after the II died, the priests took the III, who was only a little boy, just a couple years old, and made him uh, co-regent with Hatshepsut. So even though he was a two-year-old, they wanted to put him on the throne. They didn't choose Moses. Why? 
because Moses refused to accept the Egyptian religion. He would not yield and bow to the Egyptian gods, and so the priests turned against him. That's what it seems to be the case. Then uh, when Hatshepsut had ruled, she became king, remember? And in her twelfth year, 1492, the priests took the next step, and they took Tutmos III, who was now about 14 years old, and they officially initiated him into the priestly min mysteries and officially made him co-regent uh, at least 10 years before Hatshepsut dies. And as we saw yesterday, it seems likely that Moses uh, saw that Hatshepsut's days were numbered and he was not going to be Pharaoh because he would not accept the religion, so he decided to take things into his own hands try to start a rebellion among his people and with his military prowess as a general lead the armies out. But that wasn't God's plan, was it? And he went ahead of God. He didn't seek God's counsel and so he was turned into a murderer doing, trying to do the right thing but God doesn't work that way. And so Moses was forced to leave and Hatshepsut, who had been his adopted mother, his son has now become a traitor to the country. And she turns fiercely against him and seeks his life. But he's hidden, hidden away over in Mid Midian, which is somewhere in between the, the, two, uh, the two arms of the Red Sea there, the Gulf of Suez or the Gulf of Aqaba, probably over toward the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. We don't know for sure where he went, but he successfully hid and was married to who? Zipporah, that's right. Zipporah, which means a bird. And his father-in-law was Jethro, or his other name, Ruel, priest of Midian, Midian, but a true believer in the true God because Midian was a part of the line of Abraham, but just not through Isaac. So he still retained a belief in the true God. While Moses was over there in Midian, we're, we were back slaving away in Egypt. And you remember when Hatshepsut died? He, she disappeared, remember? We never knew what happened to her. The scholars think that she got maybe done in by Tutmos III. He got rid of her because immediately after that she died, you see he tried to cut out her picture out of all the monuments. So you go to Israel and you don't see the picture of Hatshepsut anywhere. He cuts out her picture. He tries to cut out all the uh, writings that speak about her. Some of the statutes were broken into thousands of pieces and buried in a big heap. For some reason, he wanted to obliterate the memory of Hatshepsut, who had been his rival. So here he is. Here's the man, the greatest pharaoh who ever lived, Tutmos III. And let's just learn something about him during this period of 54 years in which he reigned. And he became a military genius. And fortunately, we have his annals of all of his campaigns. They're recorded on the wall there at Karnak. And they show how as soon as he became the sole ruler, 1504, he starts out on his first campaign and goes and uh, conquers uh, over in Palestine. And then it goes on to describe 16 other campaigns. Let's just pause on this one. There's a very interesting one. This campaign that he, that took, that he took place first. He fights a coalition of 330 kings that were gathered in the mouths abouts of Megiddo, the plain of Megiddo, the plain of Esdralon it's sometimes called, or the plain of Jezreel. Some people in our past history have thought that that's where the great last battle of Armageddon will be fought. I personally believe uh, that's a spiritual war that's being described between the armies of heaven and us 
and it doesn't say Megiddo, it says the mountain of Megiddo. Megiddo is not a mountain, it's just a city. It's now kind of like a mound because it's been built up with various layers, but it's not a mountain. The nearest mountain is Mount Carmel. And so I'm convinced that uh, the typology of Mount Carmel is where there was this showdown between God and the false gods, between the prophets of Baal and, the, and Elijah, the true prophet. And God revealed himself and uh, revealed himself in his sending of the fire down on the altar, which burned up not the people who were idolaters, but burned up the sacrifice, showing us this beauty of the gospel that God is wanting to save, not to, not to destroy. But the priests of Baal were intransigent, and so they were, they were wiped out in this. And I think it's a, it's a perfect picture that describes what's going to happen at the second coming when Christ comes to separate between his people and the false worshipers. So, but Megiddo, back at this time, was a city, prosperous city, and he had this great military strategy, which was recorded in his annals. And it was such a brilliant strategy that Lord Allenby, in World War I, when he was fighting the troops, uh, the Germans and the Turks, he drove them out by using the same strategy. Because the way toward Megiddo from the, the mountains of Carmel that divide you, you can go one of three ways. You can go around this way, you can go around this way, or there's a narrow road called the Aruna Road that goes right through the middle. And no one would ever expect that a large army would try to go through that. Cl cliffs hundreds of feet high on either side where soldiers above could just lop down stones and destroy the whole army without even a fight. So those 330 kings didn't even guard the road to Aruna, the Aruna Road. And that's the one Tutmos III chose. All night, he marched his troops through the Aruna Road. The next morning, he was there, surprised them, and conquered the 330 uh, coalition of kings. Amazing account. And Lord Allenby accomplished the same thing in World War I. So, 16 more campaigns to Palestine almost every year. He builds up this formidable army. We learn what the chariots were like. He is the one that popularized the using of the chariots, which were the tank force of the army. Then uh, the chariots had two men that drove them, one that, one that rode and one that uh, did the fighting. In contrast to some of the chariots in, the Philistine, or the, the, uh, in Palestine and others that had a three-horse chariot. But in, in this day, they didn't ride the horses. And so when it says Pharaoh and his horsemen, it's not talking about Pharaoh and his cavalry. It's talking about Pharaoh and the ones that are riding the chariots that are pulled by the horses. Then he had his infantry with the spears and the shields and the bows and arrows and the daggers, and then the quartermaster troops that were the ones that made sure the army kept going through the countryside. So great building projects he accomplished. He was the greatest builder of all time in the history of Egypt. Port cities of Gaza, Byblos up there in Syria, etc. He uh, builds the cities of Kantir Ramses, uh, which were built by the slave labor, our slave labor, remember? And uh, roads were built, first road, organized roadways throughout the ancient world, government reserves of cedar forests that he harvested the cedars from up in Lebanon. He, he had experiments to introduce new species into it. He actually introduced, he bragged about introducing a species that would give birth Every day, the chicken. It lays an egg every day, right? And he was the one that introduced chickens as well as lions and elephants to Egypt. And his empire stretched from Nubia down there, the gold mines, all the way to Palestine and Phoenicia where he got the cattle and the timber and the oil and the administrative centers he put throughout his empire. And he would put advisors in each local place to 
assured that they sent the tribute to him, and he would even invite the crown princes from other countries to come and train under him so that they became indoctrinated into the ways of Egypt. So basically the wealth of all Asia, all the world, the then known world, flowed into the coffers of Tutmos III. He was an enlightened ruler, cruel but enlightened. He didn't like corruption. And toward the end of his life, he appointed his son, not the firstborn, because the firstborn, his firstborn son had died by then. So he appointed another son, Amenhotep II, and they ruled together for three years before Tutmos III died, March 17, 1450. There, in a nutshell, is his life. Now let's fit the biblical picture in and let's recall how this all comes together. So here he is, the Pharaoh of the Ten Plagues. Moses comes back from Egypt, uh, from Midian to Egypt. And as we saw in this, this is the same slide I showed you yesterday, the ten plagues, the first nine plagues are in three cycles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The first plague of each cycle has Pharaoh me meeting Moses as he's coming out of his palace down to the water's edge to perhaps bathe, but for sure to offer sacrifices, to, to do the rituals in honor of the god of the river, Hapi, the god of the river. So we can imagine, looking at this picture, that Moses was there on that roadway waiting for when Pharaoh came down the ramp from his palace that he would just encounter him and say, thus says the Lord, God of Israel, let my people go. And he said that. He said that in his, in his introduction when he showed the signs, and then he showed it before the first plague and before the second, third, fourth, and the seventh. First, fourth, and seventh, he met him here at the river. The second plague and the fifth and the eighth, he went and had an audience with Pharaoh. And that's where this picture is helpful because you see the one that's close to the river is the one that we saw in the last slide, but south of that was this bigger palace that was the reception hall. And they've actually excavated and found there in the right and sort of to the left of the middle uh, where you see it says reception hall and then in front of that is the vestibule and scholars who believe the story, who believe in the historicity of Exodus, are, are quite sure that this is the very spot where Moses walked into the vestibule and had an audience with the Pharaoh and told him, let my people go. But if you refuse, here's the next plague. Which brings us to the underlying purpose of the plagues. In Exodus 12, 12, God says, I'm bringing these plagues to execute judgments on all the gods of Egypt. And it's fascinating as you look at each plague. Each plague involves the discrediting of one of the many gods, sometimes several of the gods of Egypt. And so, uh, primarily, Pharaoh was considered God. He was the god Horus, the god of wisdom, the god who upheld the stability of the order, the God who made sure that all the other gods got along. And when things went wrong in his country, he's the one that took the ultimate responsibility. And throughout the plagues, the way Moses writes the story, it makes it clear that God is dismantling Pharaoh's credibility. Pharaoh is the one that had the... He, he was pictured with a shepherd's staff in his hands. And so what does God do? He has Moses come with his shepherd's staff, the rod of God, throws it on the ground, and it becomes a snake. And then Pharaoh says, come on, magicians, and the magicians make theirs into snakes. And so what does God do then? He has Moses' snake eat up all the others, swallow them. They don't even have any sticks anymore. And so the rod of Pharaoh's power gets swallowed by the rod of God's power. And one after another, these plagues discredit so I like to think of it this way, just looking down the list, I ask this question. Where were you, Hapi, god of the Nile, 
when Yahweh turned your river to blood. Where were you, Heka, the frog god, when Yahweh inundated your land with frogs? And they were piled high, and when they died, they formed, as the Hebrew says it, heaps, heaps of sloppy, slimy, smelly, decomposing frogs. Where were you, frog god, when all your frogs got turned to slime? We could keep on going. Where were you, Jeb, the Egyptian god of the earth, when out of the earth comes forth flies and covers all the people and all the animals? Where were you, Baal Zephon, uh, uh, Zebub? That's because they also worship Baal in Egypt. They brought in Baal worship, and so one of the gods was the Lord of the Flies that the Philistines worshipped. Where were you, Lord of the Flies? Where were you, Uachit, the fly god of Egypt, when God bought the biting, stinging flies that covered all of your body and discredited those gods? Where were you, Hathor, the cow-headed goddess, when all the disease came upon all the cows and they all died? Where were you, Is Isis, the goddess of medicine and peace, when the boils could not be healed? Where was Seth, the divine protector of the harvest, the storm god, when God brought hail that wiped out all that was left from um, other uh, and the animals that were left outside that had been left from the uh, disease of the cattle. Where were you, Senehem, the locust headed god of protection, when the locusts came? This last week I've been doing research on the locusts. Amazing how they turn. They're just regular grasshoppers. But when things get very, uh, uh, they overcrowd overpopulation, and they rub against each other's back legs at least four times in four hours, it triggers their brain and that reduces serotonin, which turns them gradually over a period of time into monsters, basically, where they, all they want to do is eat. And they will, if someone gets in their way, like another grasshopper, they will eat the grasshopper. But they start spreading until they are in the millions. They are in the billions. They have calculated that one, one of these locust swarms, that actually when it gets this big, it's called still today a locust plague, involved 12.7 trillion locusts, totally covering the ground. And we look at the biggest locust swarm we could ever think of, and then we read in the Bible, this locust plague was worse than any that had come before or that ever would come again. And you get to re realize why, why Pharaoh Thutmose III would cry for Moses, come, help, stop the, stop the plague. But unfortunately, every plague, when it was stopped, Moses hardened his heart more until it finally comes to the darkness. Now, darkness doesn't seem such like a thing that would be that harmful. Why would God save that toward the last? It's not because of the pain that it causes. It's because the main god of Egypt was the sun god. They actually had four sun gods, one god for when it rose, one god for when it was in the sky, one god for when it was setting, and then another god that stood for the whole sun, Ra, Amun, Re, Aten, and Atum. And this three-day darkness that could even be felt was a slam against the major god of Egypt. Where is your god who is supposed to be the one that brings all your life when Yahweh turns it dark? And then finally, the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. But before we get to that one, Let's just ask a couple of questions. Let's ask this main question. I have a lot of students, a lot of people when I go traveling that ask me this question. Why, or 
let's put it this way. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart or did Pharaoh harden Pharaoh's heart? I think the answer is both. Because God, as we put here, the Old Testament principle is that God often takes responsibility for that which he allows. You find a good example of that in Job chapters 1 and 2. God did not send all of the destruction upon Job's children and the boils upon Job, but he allowed Satan to do it because Satan had charged God with putting a hedge around Job so that Job was only worshiping him because of his goodies that God was getting, giving him. So God said, okay, let's, let's just see whether he really worships me or not. So he took back his, his hands and Satan went at it. So he allowed it, but in chapter 2, when Satan starts coming up to the assembly again in heaven, God says, have you considered my servant Job? Why have you incited me against him? Now, did God do anything against him? But now he's taking credit for it. Part of this has to do with the fact that all of the religions surrounding Israel were polytheists. They believed in good gods and bad gods. And if God raised up Satan too much in the Old Testament, people would think he was just the bad god and here's the good God, and they would think of Satan as some kind of divinity. God did not want that to happen, and so God took re ultimate responsibility for everything that happened, what he allowed and what he actually did. But there's other clues besides this general principle. Uh, how many times does the Bible say that Pharaoh's heart was hardened? Twenty times! But the amazing thing is, that ten times it's Pharaoh that hardens his heart and ten times it's God that hardens his heart. So if it's ten and ten, and furthermore, the references to Pharaoh's harden his heart come first, and then in the last part of the plagues, God is said to harden his heart. Do you see the implication of that? Pharaoh hardens his heart, and God allows it, but when it has come so hard that he's basically committed the unpardonable sin, then God comes and actually uses a different Hebrew word for God hardening. It actually is the word to strengthen. God strengthens his resolve so that he do, will do, be able to do what he really wants to do, and that is resist him. God gives him freedom of choice and gives him his choice. So it's amazing how the plagues are really showing God's mercy. Every time God is ready to give a plague, he first warns Pharaoh. Pharaoh, I don't want to do this to you. Just let my people go and this won't happen. So he's basically ten times trying to soften Pharaoh's heart. But Pharaoh will have none of it. First five plagues, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Only after the sixth plague does the record state that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And six and seven actually mix both Pharaoh and God, which t implies to me God gives Pharaoh free choice, then God honors that choice, and God's initial hardening does not once and for all terminate Pharaoh's ability to exercise free choice. You've heard this illustration. I think it's a nice one. Uh, that the same sun which hardens the clay melts the butter. God sends his rays of light upon all of us. We have the choice. Do we want our hearts to be responsive, to be open, be melted like butter, or do we want to stiffen in clay and be hardened? We choose. <coughs> I have to read this one quote from Patriarchs and Prophets. There was no exercise of supernatural power to harden the heart of the king. God gave to Pharaoh the most striking evidence of divine power, but the monarch stubbornly refused to heed the light. Every display of infinite power rejected by him rendered him the more determined in his rebellion. The seeds of rebellion that he sowed when he rejected the first miracle produced their harvest as he continued to venture on his own course, going from one decree of stubbornness to another. His heart became more and more hardened until he was called to look upon the cold, dead faces of the firstborn. 
which leads us to the tenth plague. Now, Tutmos III's son had already died years before. His son was on the throne as well, so he was also Pharaoh. There were two Pharaohs ruling at this time, Pharaoh and his son Amenhotep II. Amenhotep II did have a firstborn son. And very interestingly, the Egyptians, of course, would never acknowledge that they had ever been defeated or that anything miraculously happened against their gods. You know, they would suppress that from being written. But you find, according to the record, the Egyptian archaeologists, and they don't, these are ones that don't even believe in the Bible record. They're just doing straight archaeology for the sake of archaeology. They say, we cannot understand what happened to Amenhotep II's firstborn son. He disappears without a trace. Hmm, wonder why. Wonder why. But there is an indirect evidence for what happened to his son because notice this, Tutmos the fourth, which was the next ruler after Amenhotep II, he was not scheduled to be Pharaoh. And so he writes this stela, this, this tablet, right in the and, and places in the paws of the Sphinx. You know, the, pillar, the pyramids are back here, and then there's this great Sphinx statue that's out in front, and in the middle is that stela that he wrote. And in that Sphinx stela, he says that as a young man, he took a nap in the shadow of the great Sphinx, and the gods came and said that he would be the next king. Now, why would the gods have to come and tell him he would be the next king if he were the firstborn? They wouldn't. So it shows there was a firstborn that was missing, and he unexpectedly was pressed into service to be the next king. These are the kinds of indirect evidences we have in the text that helps to see the Exodus story fits here precisely. So we go to the Passover. Now let's just uh, get our bearings on the dating. The year was 1450. We figured that. That's 480 years after the fourth year of, of um, Solomon built when he started building the temple. It was the spring of the year because that's when the Passover came. More specifically, Passover always came on the 14th day of Nisan. And we can go to... Uh, calculators that can give us exactly when that date was in our, in our terminology, and it was Thursday, March 10, 1450, when they offered that Passover lamb. Now, we were there, remember? Remember how we gathered together and we took the blood of the Passover lamb and put it on the door and the lintel? And we dared to believe the word of the Lord that anyone who was under the blood would be safe. And you remember even some of the Egyptians that believed. They dared to come and join us and to be there with us under the blood. And so at midnight, when the angel passed over, it says in Exodus 12, that he saw the blood on the doorposts and the firstborn was spared. And so that night, we were all redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. What a great day that was. And fifth, fourth, almost 1,500 years later, there was another Passover lamb named Jesus who hung on a cross at Passover time. And he died so that we didn't have to die. And he's just asking us, take my blood. Let me apply it to the doorposts and the lentils of your heart. And I will deliver you from the bondage of sin, just like the Passover lamb delivered Israel of old from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. That's the message of the Passover service. So the next day, Friday, we headed out. We were free! Free at last, after all those years of bondage, we left Ramses and traveled south to Sukkot, Tel Maskuta, in the Wadi Tumalat, that valley that goes out to the east toward the desert. And we stayed there 
did about a 22-mile hike that day, Sherman. It was kind of rough, but we made it through the sands of uh, the desert. We got down to the, to the uh, town of Sukkot. There were still some of our Hebrew people that lived there, so we all gathered together there, and we spent the Sabbath there. And Moses gave us some further instructions about our trip that we're ready to take starting on Sunday morning. And so, sure enough, we start out, and you can see where the arrow... I don't know if I can make this work or not. I don't think I can. But the arrow comes down here, and then we start out from where the arrow ends, and we go, we're going right down this way, heading south. And it is a, a beautiful route. We go out through the Pelusiac channel of the Nile, which has shifted directions now. It's not in the same place, but it looked something like this. This is another one of the channels of the Nile that's near where uh, the, uh, the original one was. These are remains. Do you recognize those bricks? Sherman, I bet you made one of that brick right there in the front. Looks to me like that would be one that you would make. Uh, we made those bricks, my friends. This is the bricks of Tel Maskuta, Sukkot, where we had to work. They're still there. It's our exodus. So on March 11, we baked our bread and we rested over Sukkot and we celebrated our first Sabbath and freedom, which happened to be the third day. That's kind of interesting. Freedom, and then we celebrate our freedom on the third day, maybe a type of Christ's resurrection. We gather here for the three-day journey. Why do I say three-day journey? Well, uh, first let's see a couple of slides. Here we are going along on the flatlands. There's no hills up in the northern part of Egypt. It's just flat sand. And Ellen White specifically says in Signs of the Times, uh, April 1, 1880, on the third day of their journey, the Hebrews encamped by the Red Sea. Now, if you recall, three times in the Exodus account, Moses went into Pharaoh and said, please let us go on a three-day journey into the wilderness so we may sacrifice to our God. Three times he said that. And when I was... Uh, 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 speaking over in Poland a few years ago. A very astute Polish uh, listener came up afterwards and says, I have a real problem with these texts because God said he was going to only let them go, they're only going to go three and a half days, or three days, but then they got away. It seems like God was breaking his word. So I started thinking about that. And then the answer came to me. I think it's the right answer. God didn't break his word. God went exactly three days' journey. And that gets you to the Red Sea. And we'll see exactly where that is, where they were hemmed in by the Red Sea. They couldn't go any further. That was the place they were having their feast. But Pharaoh comes because he changes his mind. He hardened his heart again. And he comes and tries to force them to go back. Pharaoh broke his word. He said they could go, and now he's taking them back, which freed God then to say, okay, you're going to break your word? That leaves me free to open the sea, and my people are free. Goodbye, Pharaoh. I think God was faithful to his word, but Pharaoh broke the agreement. So God was able then to move beyond without of uh, deceiving Pharaoh earlier. Now that's, I, that's the way I take it. And Ellen White confirms it was a three-day journey starting from Telmacusta, Sukkot, on Sunday. And we head southward. Ellen White specifically and I, uh, suggest, says that too. Instead of pursuing the direct route to the Canaan, which lay through the country of the Philistines, the Lord directed our course southward toward the shores of the Red Sea. And you can see it also in the biblical account, Exodus 13 and 14. We were heading eastward toward the border between Canaan and Sinai. There were some border camps there, border controls. There were some lakes, but we could have made it through there since the king had given us permission to leave. But as we're headed in that direction, God turned us 
the text says, turned us back toward the Red Sea. And actually, uh, we ca- do the calculation and it works out precisely. In ancient times, the speed in which they could travel was about 15 to 18 miles a day. That's the best estimates of those who have measured what large groups as they're migrating, how much they could do. Um, and so the distance from Sukkot down to the Red Sea is 55 miles, just a nice three-day journey south. Some argue, oh, it wasn't the Red Sea. It was just those bitter lakes that were just east of uh, the Wadi Tumalat. They just crossed through the, the shallow lakes that were filled with reeds. Well, you know, if you're going to have an army drown in water that's a few feet deep, it's a greater miracle that, the, that they drowned. Because how can you drown an army in three feet of water or six feet of water? It has to be a sizable amount of water with a depth and a length of more than just these bitter lakes. And furthermore, it has to have a mountain by it. Because as Ellen White writes, Patriarchs and Prophets 283, the Hebrews were encamped beside the sea whose waters presented a seemingly impassable barrier before them while on the south a rugged mountain obstructed their further progress. You were there, you remember, as Moses said, oh, we got to turn this way. We got to go south now toward the west side of the Red Sea. And we said, huh? How can we go through there? We know we can't get through there. This is what God says. You got to go this way. And so we came down. I think I've got a map coming up here. Um, Yeah, tell the people to turn back and encamp in front of Pihahiroth, mouth of the canal. There was an ancient canal that went north from uh, the Red Sea at the time of uh, of Tutmos the first, third. Between Migdol, that's fortress, and the sea, in front of Mount baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. So there was a mountain that came right down to the sea. And Ellen White, I think, was an eyewitness to this. And here's, uh, let's see where, yeah, she already, I already read that. While on the south, a rugged mountain obstructed their further progress. So if you trace, I'm going to try to uh, show this because the, the, the line does not show where. So here we're coming down. There's the Bitter Lakes. And then right here is... Suez, the current city of Suez, and then this mountain right here, Jebel Ataka. It comes right down and touches against the water there about four miles south of the present day city of Suez. And it's about four miles across at that point, and there is a land bridge that's just been discovered that's beautiful sand, about 30 feet deep under the water, and goes the four miles across, half mile wide. You do the calculation of two and a half million people can easily cross with their animals and their carts in a night and get across the other side. It fits precisely the topography that we find in, in northern um, Egypt. By the way, this is the only mountain there is in northern Egypt. North of this, all those other locations like the Bitter Lakes, they have no mountains up there, it's just flat land. So if you're going to go town and you're going to find a mountain that hits against the sea, this is the spot. It's got to be this spot. This is what Ellen White pointed out, and this is what uh, many scholars are now recognizing. So here's that mountain, Jebel Ataka, off in the distance, that comes down touching to the sea and we get a little closer to it and we can see it now even a little better maybe here's the mountain if I don't fall off here here's the mountain right there that's coming down right there and our group stopped right there I think we may have been, may have been one of the first tour groups to go there but I was determined to look at this place uh, there was unfortunately an army station that was a military station about a half a mile south further and uh, 
We got out and took our pictures, and then the military people came and thought we were trying to spy on the land of Egypt and <laughs> almost uh, threw us out of the country. But uh, we assured them, no, we're not doing anything, anything harmful. We're just trying to understand the Bible, and so they let us go. They wanted to take away all of our pictures, but we talked them out of it. So praise God, we got the pictures. Uh, there's a major theory that that was popularized by Ron Wyatt some years ago. Now, some of you have seen his theory that argues that they did not cross at the, at the Gulf of Aqaba, which, or at the Gulf of Suez over here. Whoops. They didn't cross over here at this arm, but they crossed over here, right in the middle of the Gulf of Aqaba at Nueva. And then some others, Robert Cornis suggests, no, it was down here at the Straits of uh, the Straits of, what, uh, what was he called? What do they call it? The Straits of Hormon, yes. Uh, and then they went over, and Mount Sinai is actually over in Jebel Allah's of Arabia rather than down in the traditional place. You know, I, I always look at any, any arguments that come up, I try to take them seriously and see whether they're true or not based upon the biblical evidence. And unfortunately, this, this theory I cannot see can be substantiated from Scripture. I got 12 reasons here, and I've only got seven minutes to do. So I'm just going to really quick them, go over them. But uh, they, it's based on false assumptions. The first false assumption is that Sinai is part of Egypt. The biblical record and the Egyptian record is clear. Sinai is not part of Egypt. It is a foreign land outside of Egypt. Second false assumption that Mount Sinai is in the, Mount, is, is in the land of Midian, in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. But the scholars have shown clearly that Midian included the land in the South Sinai as well as the land on the east of the Gulf of Aqaba. That whole south, southern Sinai Peninsula was also called Midian. And then uh, this uh, refers again to Galatians 4.25. Mount Sinai is in, is in Arabia, says Paul in Galatians 4. That now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Yes, in the first century, Strabo, the geographer, when he talked about Arabia, Arabia meant everything east of the Gulf of Aqaba and also all of the Sinai Peninsula. That was all Arabia to him. And so Arabia does not mean just east of, the, uh, east of the Gulf of Aqaba. Other considerations. Ellen White said it was a three-day journey. If you're going to get over to the site where John, Ron Wyatt says the crossing happened, you've got you to you walk um, 253 miles in three days. Anybody here want to try doing that? With two and a half million people? It's impossible. The three-day journey can lead you to only one spot, and that is the top part of the Gulf of Suez, where Ellen White describes it. And uh, the, uh, just another, go through another couple of evidences. The Red Sea is mentioned at the beginning of the itinerary with only two camping spots before it. If you're going to travel 263 miles, you've got to camp more than twice. So if you put it way over there, you're missing the point. And then they came, right after crossing, they came to the wilderness of Shur. And scholars are very clear. They all point out the wilderness of Shur is up north of the, and east of the Gulf of Suez. It's not over in Saudi Arabia. There's no, there's no wilderness of Shur over there. And if Mount Sinai is over there, the Bible text says it's an 11-day journey from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. Well, the scholars have, have shown where... Kadesh Barnea is. It's exactly 11 days journey from Jebel Musa where we're going to be heading tomorrow. But it's weeks from the other side way over there. And plus what Ron Wyatt claims to have found when he snuck into Saudi Arabia and then was thrown into jail for doing that, for illegally going in, uh, he claimed, oh, I saw this altar for the golden calf. Saudi archaeologists have examined all of his evidence and found that that altar was a Neolithic altar long earlier before the time of, the time of uh, Moses. Then he saw, found an altar of Moses and 12 pillars, and another archaeologist, Saudi archaeologist, showed the pottery from that to be the time of the Nabataeans, the 2nd century B.C., 
1,200 years later than the time of Moses. And then Mount Sinai was covered with smoke. It was smoke scorched black. Well, who says that a theophany by God has to scorch black the mountain? He shows up in fire, but he doesn't have to burn up the mountain. So that one just... And then the land bridge. This one, this one was the most amazing to me. Ron Wyatt claimed there's a land bridge at Nueva that goes straight across. You can go on Google Map and you can test how, water, how deep the water is. The water, if you call this a land bridge, it's 2,300 feet deep. Going down at a 60 degree angle with live coral beds sharp enough to cut through your feet and cut through the feet of all the animals. And that's no land bridge. That's a mirage. <laughs> so the chariot wheels, he claimed to see the chariot wheels. My archaeologist friend, Randy Yonker, sent a scuba diving expedition over to the spot where Wyatt claimed to see the chariot wheels. And indeed, he found some circular objects and they excavated and they tested them and they are living corals called table corals that grow in a circular shape. They look like wheels, but they're coral, natural growing coral. So anyway, sorry, Ron Wyatt, may his soul rest in peace. He's now dead, but his theory lives on. But this one just we have to, we have to say no to. The weight of evidence points toward the northern tip of the Gulf of Suez opposite Jebel Ataka for the place of the crossing of the Red Sea and Mount Sinai in the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula. And you see the map again where we've talked about that. And there's our trip. And now this, we gotta, we gotta get in the date here. We arrive on Tuesday, March 15. According to the calculation, if we know when Passover is, and then we stay over Sabbath, and then we start our three-day journey, we arrive on Tuesday, March 15. Pharaoh's army catches up with us the next day, and we're shocked to see that he's coming. We realize we're hemmed in, we're trapped, and so God makes a way through the sea. He puts a pillar of fire over us and a pillar of cloud that blocks so Pharaoh can't see all night long, and we cross the Red Sea all night and arrive on the morning of March 17, 1450. Now, I've done all that calculation from the Bible, not going to Egyptian history. This, to me, is the, is the, the, the silver bullet. There's only one pharaoh that died anywhere near this time. In fact, there's only one pharaoh in the whole 18th dynasty that we even know when he died. But this pharaoh had his general record his death date. And guess when it says he died? March 17, 1450. Amen. The evidence from the Bible exactly correlates with the evidence from archaeology. The very day that Tutmos III died was the day we crossed over the Red Sea and he drowned in the Red Sea. Isn't that, a, isn't that powerful? So here the, my students are. They were shouting, seeing if they, maybe the Lord would open up the sea again, but he didn't choose to do it for them. So it was something like this, except it was a half a mile wide, so plenty of space for them all to go through. And now we're over on the other side, and I'm pointing with my finger to Jebel Ataka with that four-mile stretch of water there on the other side. And... Egyptian history fits perfectly. Let me summarize it. The only pharaoh to die anywhere near this time is recorded as dying on this very day, March 17, 1450, Tutmos III, the greatest pharaoh of all time. We even have his mummy. I used to hear HMS Richards preach sermons about this, saying, tongue-in-cheek, poor Moses, he gave up all this wealth. He could have been a mummy in the Cairo Museum with hundreds and millions of people gawking over him. Instead, he had to be buried on, on Mount Nebo and raised a few days later and has eternal life. Poor Moses. But it gets even worse. 
because they've now x-rayed the pharaohs and they found out this ain't Tutmos the third he needed to be at least 60 years old and by looking at his bones and his teeth this is like a 40 year old they never found his body they just grabbed some body and stuffed him into a casket and he, there he is Tutmos the third so he didn't even make it to the Israel Cairo Museum the supposed mummy of Tutmos III does not fit the profile of the actual pharaoh. Pharaoh Tutmos was 60. X-rays don't support such an age. It seems that Tutmos III's body was never recovered. Another body was substituted. And just a few facts that add icing to the cake that were on the right trail. The actions of Amenhotep II, that was the one on the throne whose son died, after his father's death, here's what happened in quick succession. And all of this evidence comes from archaeologists that do not believe the story of the Exodus. They don't have an explanation for this, but they have to acknowledge this. this is what happened. Right after the Exodus, a new breed of horses was introduced into Egypt. Why would they need a new breed of horses all of a sudden? I wonder. And then they changed the chariot construction, and all the chariots now had six spokes rather than four spokes. Why do you think they felt they needed stronger chariots or more chariots at all? Wonder where those chariots went. And then this capital city of Avaris that I showed you the palace, it was suddenly and mysteriously abandoned. There's no burn layer. There's no destruction layer. They just left. I wonder why they would leave after all their gods were discredited and all their land was destroyed and all their animals were destroyed by the plagues. I wouldn't stick around that haunted place, haunted by Yahweh, if I were a worshiper of one of those gods. And then the campaigns to Palestine, right after this, Amenhotep II goes charging up to Palestine and he grabs over 100,000 Semitic slaves and brings them back to Egypt. Why do you suddenly need a hundred thousand Egyptian sla and more slaves for the Egyptians? You must have lost a few. And then, last but not least, in these two tombs alone of these two pharaohs, Tutmos III, the one I believe that died in the Red Sea, and Amenhotep II, the one whose firstborn son died, the two that were ruling together. It's only in these tombs, and I've been to both of these tombs, I've been to most of the tombs of the kings, and it's only those two that have a special drawing on the wall, drawing of water with dead Egyptian soldiers floating in the water. You can see it here from the tomb of Anamhotep II. And what is more, the other one in the tomb of Tutmos III has a picture of this wall of water, but then it has, here's the picture down here, it has people standing on the water, the gods are standing on the water, but then there's an open space. The sea has been opened up. And here is all the forces of chaos and evil that are put here with all of this garbage that's put in the middle it shows that they believed that there was an opening up of the sea and the dead soldiers of Egyptians were on either side. Hmm, wonder why they would want that picture on their walls if it didn't happen in their time. Well, those are my questions with which I end. But I can't end without realizing when we got to the other side, we sang the Song of Moses. Anybody here uh, Irish? Descendant, keep St. Patrick's Day. Notice that's March 17, St. Patrick's Day. But I'd like to suggest there's another important day that even takes precedence over St. Patrick's Day. I call it Exodus Day. So anybody that's going to be preaching sermons around March 17, preach on the Exodus. Preach on these things that God has done for us. And then sing. So we're going to end with Miriam and Moses leading us in the singing of the Song of Moses. And this was recorded on site in a round from Exodus chapter 15. You can follow along in your Bible. Listen. Go for it, guys. This one. Sorry. He has triumphed gloriously. The horse arrived his own into the sea. 
I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider go into the sea. The Lord will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider go into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, will now become my victory. The Lord. My God, my strength, my song is now become my victory. The Lord is God, and I will praise Him. Everyone, the Lord is God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. Hey! Were, they, were we happy? Do you think we're going to be happy in Revelation 15 when we sing this song of Moses together? And then we sing the second stanza, which is the song of the Lamb. We run out of time, but we have tomorrow. So we're going to start tomorrow, get here right at 1045. I'm going to play this again, and then we're all going to sing it together. Okay, let's have a prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for bringing us out of Egypt and allowing us to sing the song of Moses for delivering us from slavery and from the wicked hands of Pharaoh and his troops. And thank you, Lord, for hanging on the cross and being the dying lamb that delivered us from the bondage of sin. And thank you that one day soon we will be able to stand not walk through, but stand in victory on the sea of glass and sing with all the redeemed of all the ages the song of Moses and its second stanza, the song of the Lamb. Lord, we want you to hear our, our silent determination prayer. We want to be there, Lord. We choose you, not the gods of Pharaoh or the gods false gods around us. We choose you to be our God. And we choose to be there without one missing. Thank you, God, for hearing. Amen. Remember the Exodus. <laughs>